there are some key so, but there are some key significant areas where we execute different projects over time. Um, some of them are education and employment, climate and environment, we also focus on equity and inclusion. We have been running our Meet the Leader series for a while, and there are a series of intimate informal gatherings where shippers and friends of the, of the shippers community meet with a leader who shares insights, experiences, and learnings. Um, it is we, we never have a crowd in our shippers community in our middle leader sessions because we do want them to be very intimate. We want people to be as open as possible with asking their questions, and we want the people that we're speaking with to feel to to know that this is a safe space that you know we can be honest and have um, honest conversations with us. For anyone who is interested in knowing more about the global shippers community, please follow us on Instagram, on LinkedIn, and on Twitter. On Instagram, we're Lagos Shapers. On LinkedIn, we're the Global Sh we the Global Shapers Community Lagos Hub. Um, I will now go ahead and read Lord Hastings' profile, and then we'll move right into the sessions. Just to note, this is the the Mid Leader series are focused on. So while while our leaders typically have like a thematic areas where they're focused on, you know, where, and where they're working on. We typically focus our questions on overall growth and personal leadership. So it's personal leadership, career, people's journeys, like learning from life lessons. Um, they say that people's, they say that the biggest lessons are in people's stories. So we actually really do want to hear some of those stories. Um, so I'm going to go right ahead and read Lord Hastings' profile now. And Simba, before you do that, can we ask everyone to turn their cameras on? Because I don't, I can't speak to blank pages. So if people, because otherwise, then we know they're really listening. I know what people do when they don't have their cameras on. They fiddle about and they pay no attention. So if they don't put their cameras on, we can't proceed. Okay, please do put your cameras on. All right. No matter where you are, there's quite a few hiding themselves. Joshua, Charles, Vishnu, Hamid, Fatima, Kashika, come on. really good to see everyone's faces see they really exist don't they see you thought <laughs> they, they were do. just phantoms <laughs> like i still love along the road with like cars come on charles someone's in mean... san francisco well yeah Actually, you know background <laughs> okay so wisdom babajide hamid charles and kessa Ah, there you go, Sam. Now he's in a sports hall. <laughs> Joshua, oh. Charles. On me, it's there. On me. Eight people with their cameras on. Hamid, Joshua, Charles. Fatima. Wisdom says apologies, he didn't set up for um, camera to take a while. Okay, but this camera is on. I know Fatima was in the car a couple of minutes ago, so I guess she's probably getting off. To get mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you go ahead, and um, I'm sure they'll better come on by then. <laughs> okay, fantastic. I'm sure they will. Um, so, Lord Dr. Michael Hastings of Scarsbury CBE has an illustrious career across the public, private, and nonprofit sectors, working within education, philanthropy, and business to support and develop communities worldwide. He currently serves as the chair of the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London and as Professor of Leadership at the Stephen L. Covey Institute at the University of Utah. 
Lord Hastings is also the vice president at UNICEF UK and a trustee for the Africa Philanthropy Foundation. Lord Hastings is the former head of public affairs at the BBC and was the first head of corporate social responsibility. He also served as a global head of citizenship for APMG and a former trustee of the, of the Vodafone Group Foundation and subsequently a governor of the Vodafone Safaricom and PESA Academy in Nairobi for 800 of Kenya's poorest children. Lord Hastings began his career as a teacher, then worked across government agencies on policies to build racial equality, workforce development, and safer and more effective crime prevention strategies. Please welcome with me, Lord Hastings. Okay, so I'll move right into the questions. Um, I, think, I think we still have a problem, Shimba, because wisdom yeah. is evading visualization and Charles and Fatter and I'm a, I just know that people don't pay attention um, okay. when they're not, they're not on camera. They just, they do other things. Okay. So if they want to respect my time, they should be on camera because I'm on camera. Okay. Um, to my own camera, Dean, in more wisdom, wisdom, wisdom did mention I, he's trying to set up. So I'm going to take him a little bit of time. Charles says he's been trying to talk with, can't hear him. He says it's actually his first time joining, but he's in a crowded place at the moment, but I can assure you he's listening to every word. Charles says, kindly bear with me for today. Um, just for today. <laughs> for today. Um, Imo, can you put on your camera? Dean, can you please put on your camera? Gloria, if you can change the name of the Impact Hub Lagos and put on your camera will be greatly appreciated. Can I just say I really like this because we're usually not putting on a camera for this. We're in <laughs> everybody's <laughs> under everybody's you know saying nothing yeah. Put on the cameras. Um, but I, I I must also mention that sometimes people have really poor in well, I mean not really poor, but the internet isn't great. So they, they leave off the video bits to save bandwidth. Um sometimes. So I'm not sure what is the intention behind you know the, the camera. Now wisdom's on, set, that's good or? to see. Okay. Oh. Joshua. Sometimes the camera off um, is, is easier to manage the network. Yeah, great symbol. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I see new, more, new people, good, are joining. Good, people are joining. Good morning, guys. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. Sorry, I can't keep my camera on because I'll be driving. Yeah, driving. So, yeah. Apologies. Yeah. Good. Okay. okay. Thanks for that, Dean. Um, I see a Mary, I see a Tolu, Imo. For everybody who's joining us afresh, um, Lord Hastings has asked that we should please put on our cameras for those who can. Okay, all right. Lord Hastings, we're wondering if it's possible. So um, for those who may be driving like Dean and you know maybe a couple of other people who are in places where they may not be able to put on their cameras, um, just to ensure that they are um, listening and paying attention, can we have them drop comments or reactions in the chat periodically? Will that suffice? Yeah, that will suffice. Okay. So, Come on, Tolu, um, you can put your camera on. I know you're there. <laughs> Tolu, I should have had a wedding. <laughs> um, so Tolu, Imo, Joshua, Mary, um, if you can just put up, if you are able to put on your camera for a bit, and there you go. Totally speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello there. Good to see you. Um, and just ensure that you are you're engaging, putting notes in the comments. I said that you more already was chatting in the putting something in the comment section. Um, and Charles, we also look forward to chatting with you. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Lord Hesson, may we kick off now? Yep. Fantastic. All right. So the very first question is, you know, the, the, the question that we usually like to start with. So it is, tell us about your journey. Um, tell us about yourself. We've read your Wikipedia page. We've, we've I've just read your profile, but you know, just tell us about yourself and your career journey. Um, I, I guess the key moments that you think have brought you where you are today and what is important to you. Maybe not necessarily what we see out there, but what, you know, you see as what has taken you thus far or brought you thus far. Okay, thank you. And um, 
it really is good to see those of you I can see uh, and to be better assured of those of you I can't see that, that you are genuinely paying attention. And the only reason why I, I am so insistent on this is that I'm very conscious of how one of the great downsides of our technological revolution is a permanent state of distraction. And that permanent state of distraction is a real and significant weakness in how we conduct our life affairs. All of us know it. We know that um, we, we spend so much of our time, so much of our time uh, away from the presence of other people, but frankly, in the face of other people by technology. And it, we're actually dehumanizing as time goes along, and we need to strengthen the reality of human connection. I think one of the great uncomfortablenesses of the coronavirus pandemic over the last two years has been this phrase, social distancing. I think it's one of the most bizarre phrases in the world, because if you're social, you're not going to be distant. Uh, I would have called it health protection. I'm glad to see Chico agrees with me. So health protection of some kind or, or health distance, uh, but not social distancing. We're meant to be social beings, uh, people connected to other people. So we need to be visual and we need to be present. And the problem of telecommunications is that we become disconnected, but we think we're there. But in reality, we're not. So a bit about uh, that is not in my Wikipedia page, I suppose. And, uh, and what Simba has said is that uh, I'm sure it says on the Wikipedia page that uh, my father was born in Angola. Um, he was of Indian parentage. My mother was born in Jamaica. She was of half Ghanaian parentage and the other half being Panamanian. Um, so I'm a complete um, Afro-Caribbean mix in the genuine sense of the word. And unlike both my father born in Africa and my mother born in the Caribbean, I was born in the United Kingdom and then went to live in Jamaica in the mid 1960s um, and, uh, and then came back to the UK in the early 1970s. The reason my brother and I came back to living in England to going to boarding school was that uh, Jamaica was in economic and social turmoil. Uh, it's uh, not, not something unfamiliar to those of you in Nigeria, to be perfectly honest. I have so many wonderful and precious Nigerian friends, and you know what the downside of broken politics leads to uh, and what the um, mess that is created by unsolved economic non-investment that's what I witnessed in the 1970s. Our parents decided to get us away from it. So we got sent to boarding school in England. And, um, and then my life began to take a series of directions. So when you ask the question, Simbo, about career, um, so to, get, to give you a profile of my very dear brother, who was two years older than me, he would say he's had a wonderful career. He's been at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, since he was 21 years of age. He's never left. He's now 66. So he's had a lifetime career at MIT, um, being uh, obviously initially he was a grad student um, doing a master's in aerospace engineering and then became a, a professor and then became the dean and then became, then retired and became chief scientist to the US Air Force and did a whole string of other things. Then came back as a sub dean and then is now still there as professor of aeronautics and astronautics. I have never had a single directional uh, one place profile. And my brother always says, says to me, uh, Michael, you've never had a career. To which the answer is no, I haven't. I've just waited for a string of phone calls that have come along. People have invited me to do things or to take up roles or, uh, and thankfully most of them have paid rather well. So I haven't ever thought about a plan. Um, I have just followed the instinct of what's come next. Now, I say that also, and I know many of you, um, particularly because many of you being obviously Nigerians will have a, some sense of spiritual centeredness. And, and I have firmly been in the belief and conviction that God has got his own order for me and that I fit into that order. So I, I do literally wait for the next thing to come along. So I'll do, give you two examples um, of that. So you'll know that I am a member of parliament here in the United Kingdom in the upper house. Uh, we're appointed by Her Majesty the Queen, but this is not a government creation. But we have the lower house of commons, which is elected. Um, those are elected members to their constituencies and the upper house are all appointed. So I was offered 
to be a lord twice and turned it down twice. I turned it down twice because I had a firm conviction that I shouldn't be a political member. I should be an independent, non-political member. So I waited until the independent, non-political opportunity came along. For most people, if you turn down an opportunity to join parliament, then that's it. But it, kept, it came back three times and it came back because that was God's call for me. And I would just wait for when God's call would be fulfilled. Um, when I was at the BBC, where I was head of public affairs and responsible for the BBC's lobbying and political relationships and legislation, and every year responsible to make sure that Parliament voted to raise the BBC's public taxation. We call it the licence fee in the UK. And uh, while I was literally in the Director General's office at the BBC, my phone is ringing and I don't recognise the phone number, so I don't answer it. Ten minutes pass and it rings again. I, I, same number, I don't recognise it, so I don't answer it. Happens again, third time. I don't recognize the number, so I don't answer it. And then the fourth time, I thought, I wonder if this is an emergency. One of my, one if one of the three children has been caught up in some tragedy or something. I'm, maybe I need to step out. So I step out of the Director General's office, who's responsible for the whole of the BBC, which is a four and a half billion pound enterprise. So turn that in dollars, that puts it at sort of seven billion dollar business. And um, on the end of the phone is the global chairman of KPMG. And why is this man ringing me? I've never met him. We've had no connection. So why is he ringing me? I have no idea. But he basically says, would you come and have a conversation? And let's talk about um, things that matter to me. And I had no idea what mattered to him. So I went and had a conversation. We talked around. We talked around. We then had another conversation two weeks later. Talked around, talked around. Had another one two weeks later. And I finally said to him after... The third one, what are you wanting from me? And his answer was, will you come to KPMG and transform the way we think about and act upon and create a sense of our common purpose and identify our public impact beyond our exacting audit tax and business services work? And so I did once and had a wonderful 13 years at KPMG. So when you say, what's the career? There's no career. It's a journey of a series of interventions and opportunities so I'm chairman of SOAS, which is the School of Oriental and African Studies. I didn't ask to be chairman. I didn't apply to be chairman. I was asked. Somebody came and asked me. And so I said, oh, OK, I'll, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm retired from KPMG now, uh, and I'm delighted to have uh, spare time. Um, I'm a non-executive director on the board of a search firm called Saxton Banfield, one of the big five here in the UK. I didn't ask for it. They came to me. So... Life has just been a string of waiting for the phone call. Now, what is that about? Because, Simba, you're going to say, how come all these phone calls? Um, what is that about? And I'll tell you what it's about. And this is what's so important for all of you. Because I'm looking at you, I can see that most of you are sort of, well, you're definitely around, you're below 30, I, I'm assuming. Is that right? Have I got that right? Yeah. It's a, it's a bit of a mix. So early 30s and late 20s your late 20s early 30s okay i can say so yeah <laughs> charles says he's oh, below 30 well i feel like i feel like i, just, I shouldn't speak on behalf of everybody because i am in my early 30s but yeah, well, i would, long I, would here, I, will, <laughs> I was simba i was going to say 25 for you <laughs> 25 for you thank you so much um, yeah although, <laughs> well, yes, although i was going to say 55 because he's bald but, but then i noticed wisdom is too so that that's, that does carries over but <laughs> so here's the thing for all of you here's the thing for all of you how do you end up being a place where people phone you up to do things? You have to build a life of reputation. You have to build a life of reputation. And when you build a life of reputation, particularly these days with everything that social media offers in terms of the LinkedIn profiling, and you are all part of the Global Shapers community. So of course you are known to the World Economic Forum. I can guarantee you, because in every one of my 13 years at KPMG, I went to the World Economic Forum in Davos, in Switzerland. And I also chaired a number of World Economic Forum committees. And I was also heavily involved in a lot of the priorities of the World Economic Forum on behalf of KPMG. Build a life of reputation. 
if you do, your impact, not your activity, your impact is noted and noticed. And then people who take a measure of the strength of your commitment will judge you a person who is right to be involved. That is what you need to prioritize more than anything else. You, know, you can prioritize um, economic opportunity, money, jobs, incomes. Those things are good things. Uh, you can prioritize promoting yourself so that you are visible and seen. But what's the substance of what you want to be seen for? Someone died just this week who was a, uh, I called her a stateswoman. Uh, you'll know the figure Madeleine Albright. And Madeleine Albright uh, died, I think it was on Thursday. Um, a shorter lady you couldn't find, well, maybe at, at her age, but seriously short, um, you know, down in the five foot level. And for a substantial period of time, she was a US Secretary of State. What defined her, the same as Angela Merkel, who stood down as Chancellor of Germany after 16 years in September last year, what defined Angela Merkel, what defined Madeleine Albright was not their speeches, not their mass public profile, not their platforming, because in fact, you find it very difficult to find platform events for either of those two women. What defined them was their very deliberative, decisive, uh, diligent pursuit of making things happen that empowered other people. I was looking at um, a list profile this morning of countries that have received Syrian refugees. The issue of refugees is vividly alive at the moment because obviously of Ukraine, where there are 4 million people who've now exited Ukraine to the surrounding and immediate countries. This is very, very, very serious. But looking at the Syrian refugees, the country that took the largest number of Syrian refugees was Germany, 788,000. And that was Angela Merkel's decision, that she reached out at a point of severe crisis to give people stability, hope, and opportunity. Now, that's a woman whose character and caliber has gone ahead of her and was known from before her, the same as Madeleine Albright. So build a life based on reputation. And if you have reputation, people will come after you for work. Lord Heston, oh, sorry, what was that? Okay, um, I, I, think, I think I just threw my list of questions out the window. So we're just, I think we're, we're probably gonna have a bit of a conversation. So my next question to you, um, and I have a question about purpose, but I'll ask yeah. that after this one. But before that is, I'm very curious about one thing, because we're talking about that you, you've gotten, like we've built, we've built a life of reputation um, and then you've gotten a lot of phone calls. So my question is, have you never applied to anything? That's the first thing. Never, ever, ever apply to anything. No. Interesting. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just say I really think, so how do you balance waiting for that opportunity and taking action? Because as a person of faith myself, I do think that I'm by, I do think that you could, but like it's you do have to know when to move or when to take action for certain things. Um, so how do you balance out the part where you are? trying to ensure that you have the right opportunities or you're, or you're moving towards the right opportunities and also ensuring that, um, you know, just sitting and doing nothing and couching um, laziness or just being like a desicle about things or just not desicle about things with, you know, oh, I'm waiting to be certain that I'm making the right decision. Yeah, well, that's a very, very necessary question. And let me say that, that um, it is not wrong to apply and apply and apply. Mm -hmm. I was talking to somebody yesterday who uh, had applied nine times last year mm -hmm. for similar roles and finally got it in December. 
Mm. And it's the right role for this person, the absolute mm -hmm. right role for them. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with applying. So I think we need to have an open hand to mm -hmm. seek for what is good and right for us, whether our skills, our experience, our interests mm. can match with an opportunity. But we also need to be people willing to be noticed, not, mm -hmm. not those who you know, do puff daddy stuff, as in <laughs> out there. <laughs> so, sorry to mention him. <laughs> yeah, Josh was crying. Uh, and because we can self-promote mm -hmm. to such an extent, we self-promote to such an extent that what people see is, is exactly that. This is an indulgent mm -hmm. person who's interested in their own gain. That's not helpful. But mm -hmm. if we instead radiate, mm -hmm. radiate, mm -hmm. and as we radiate, we give off light, mm -hmm. and other people are drawn to the light. Mm -hmm. you know, one of the best uh, insects in the world is a bee, mm -hmm. uh, because what does a bee do? A bee comes and draws the sweet sucker and passes it on mm -hmm. to others. I mean, that's a wonderful image. And actually, bees don't sting you if you don't get in their way. Wasps are mm. a different matter, but bees mm. don't sting you if you don't get in their way. Um, we should be like bees. Come and find the place of richness and share it so that others can get the deposit benefit. Now, and therefore, mm. what I would say to you, Simba, is in the, in the waiting time, mm -hmm. in between waiting time, don't be inactive. Mm. Find powerfully important voluntary opportunities to be involved in mm -hmm. never ever ever have empty days mm -hmm. you don't, you, I don't I mean for some of you who are in Nigeria and I have been to Nigeria seven times and I you know if I was an American I'd say I love your country greatly but I because <laughs> all Americans love everywhere they go don't they <laughs> you send them some desperate place I love your country it's all great um, but uh, I genuinely I, I have been to Kano in the north, mm -hmm. where many of you haven't even been. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been to Abuja uh, four times, and I've been to Lagos five. I don't know, oh, yeah, five times. So in total, I've done seven, seven trips back and forward mm -hmm. and to Kano. And uh, I don't need to tell you. Mm -hmm. I don't need to tell you what needs to be done outside your front windows. Mm -hmm. I don't need to tell you, because you know. And how do you deal with these realities, these discomforts? Well, unless you open your own hands, because I can tell just by looking at some of you, given, given the images that are there, but also just the, your privilege of being associated with mm. the World Economic Forum, your people of skill and potential, mm. uh, you can organize. So mm -hmm. I'm going to give you the name of a Nigerian charity organization that I am on the, a bo on the board of and patron of. It's called Do Good Africa. Okay. And uh, Do Good Africa is based out of Lagos and London. Um, and it was founded by a wonderful, wonderful, one of my mentees, Tony Fola Alade. Um, and the family have a lot of business activities in Nigeria. He's currently in London. I saw him last Saturday, but he runs um, Do Good Africa. And uh, they've been very involved with the fishermen, fishermen in the lagoon area in Lagos. Mm. Actually building a school. If you notice the new school, if you go over the bridge, you notice the new school going up, that's Do Good Africa's work. Interesting. Um, okay. So, that, so therefore, what I'm saying in that, I suppose, Simba, is um, keep your heart, keep your mind and your hand open mm -hmm. to what is the right next or the best next. Um, but never, ever be, never be void. Don't sit around Netflixing all day and thinking mm -hmm. that somehow, you know, three months down the line, uh, something good's going to come along. Get active. You you live in a country that is so full of crisis. You haven't got time to be inactive. Mm. Mm. That is that, uh, well. So your point about being willing to be noticed is something that is very critical. Like Dami is on the call. Dami is one of the well, one of the members of the Lagos Hub, and it's a conversation we've had several times um, because we talk about people who've had we talk about. We, when we take a look around, there's a lot of noise and people make, you know, a lot of noise and talk about things. And we realize that sometimes um, there isn't a lot of substance to the noise, right? 
However, the, the people that are doing, that have the depth of the substance are so focused on the work that they forget to sometimes make noise about it. And yep. you find that unconsciously or subconsciously, you're thinking, I don't need to make noise to be able to show that you know I'm doing great work. Um, so that the point about being willing to be noticed is something that I hope that you're taking notes and you're, and, you're, <laughs> and you're learning this. Um, but the other thing I did want to ask was um was about okay, so if what was about thriving versus making things work. So there is a bit of a narrative, I'll, I'll, I'll give some context. So there's a bit of a narrative about, or oh, do stuff that you're passionate about that you never do a, uh, do a day of work in your life. I don't necessarily subscribe to this um, school of thought, to be fair. I think that you know, when you're doing work, try to put as much as you, know, as, you can, as you can into it. But I want to ask about, have you ever worked in a place where you felt like, like, like you weren't necessarily thriving at it, but you were still giving it your best, right? Sometimes it's not, it's not the easiest thing to do, to do, whether it's actually it's not necessarily sometimes, but it's not actually the easiest thing to do to know that I, I don't know that this is, this doesn't necessarily come naturally to me, or I'm not doing great at this thing, but I'm going to give it my best. So what advice do you have for people who are in the place where, I mean, people, people are looking forward, aspirational, looking to grow. Um, but how, have you ever had a situation in the past where You've been in a place where you're doing work that you're not necessarily thriving at. How have you been able to balance that versus ensuring that you're doing your best work? Yes, I absolutely have. And my first 18 months uh, at the BBC, where I was in a broadcasting uh, journalist role, um, doing reporting, educational reporting and political journalism, was terrible. And it was terrible because um, I, hadn't, I had not applied uh, I had been invited by the controller of the region to this particular role in London, and I was delighted to take it on. Um, and what was important for me is what happened 18 months later, because 18 months later, the director general's office, so the chief executive, the director general's office rang up and said, we have been watching you. And we have seen in watching you that you are very even-handed, you're very impartial, you're very warm and kind with the politicians that you interview, you seem to be very acceptable to people on every side, and, and so therefore we want to invite you to take on this hugely significant role to represent the BBC's interest to government and to parliament and become the head of public affairs. So you see, I had to do the grind work, and the reason I wasn't appreciated was because the um, editor at the time didn't like the fact that I had been imposed on the newsroom by a controller above him. So because he didn't like that fact, he made my life very difficult, really difficult, refused to broadcast things that I filmed, uh, wasn't interested in stories that I brought forward. I mean, I rarely got on in a year and a half on the news site, rarely got on. And just every day was just a if you come forward with something that is interesting and bright and different and that was disengaged and disconnected and of no value. Uh, so, it, so, but what you do when you're in that circumstance and you, you face, you have two options. You can, you can, you can flag mass protests, um, which in which case you become known as irritating, um, or you can actually be very determinedly diligent and do what you're paid to do. So I decided that, well, I will do what I'm paid to do. I'll do it to the best of my capability with the full enthusiasm I can muster. If, if the immediate editor pays no notice, then I'll just continue to do this out of an act of responsibility. Now, I'm going to read you a quote, and this is from a book. You can see uh, it's called Man's Search for Meaning. It would apply equally to women, uh, but it is by Viktor Frankl. And Viktor Frankl uh, survived the Second World War as a Holocaust survivor. His wife was killed in the gas chambers, as was his daughter and his son. Um, and he lived in well into the 1980s, I think it is. Uh, this is a phenomenal book, uh, actually into the early 90s. Um, and this phenomenal book on how, in the most difficult circumstances, do you find your sense of purposefulness? Now, being taken to the gas chambers, as he was in Nazi Germany, that's a tough thing to get through. And what's interesting in this book, he gives a lot of recorded evidence of people who were 
uh, taken up by the Nazis, taken to the death camps, and actually died before they were gassed or burnt. And the reason they died before they were gassed or burnt was because they gave up hope. And because they gave up hope, they stopped eating, they got sick, and they died. So the Germans didn't kill them, they killed themselves. When people lose perspective, lose hope, and lose the reason to do what they're doing, we therefore can literally become the walking dead. We can be like that. So this is what he says, having survived Nazi Germany. This is what he says about success. Ready for it? Yes, please. Don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you're going to miss it. For success, like happiness, cannot be pursued. Mm -hmm. It must ensue. And it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's dedication to a cause greater than yourself, mm -hmm. or as the byproduct of a surrender to a person other than yourself. Mm -hmm. Happiness must happen. And the same holds for success. You have to let it happen by not caring about it. I want you to listen to what your conscience commands you to do and go on to carry it out to the best of your knowledge. Then you will live to see that in the long run, in the long run, he says, success will follow you precisely because you've forgotten to think about it. Mm. And you know, I don't need to tell you, mm -hmm. there, there is the book. Such for me. Uh, one of the world's. Set it down. Yeah, it's about 12 million copies sold around the world. Um, okay. You will know how much your generation frets hmm. for success. Yep, absolutely. Frets for it. Hmm. And most don't get it. So. This is a really good segue into my next question. First, uh, the, the last question I will ask is the is a question about books, what you're reading, and what you think you most all absolutely read. But this is the perfect way to move into my next question. Yes. So, I was watching your video, your TED talk, your TED talk about um, your the TED talk. I, I forgot to say, the TED talk about purpose. Oh yeah. Um, and over the last, uh, I mean, I know that for me in particular the lockdown kind of forced me i mean to be fair I, I was in a bit of a funny headspace but it kind of forced me to sit down and rethink things and redefine direction redefine i don't know i don't i i feel like i just i, I don't i don't want i don't want to use the word purpose lightly but i feel like during that time i was forced to sit and find some clarity of direction um but i know that it's something that many people look for almost for their entire lives some people don't some people don't necessarily are not necessarily conscious about it so they just go through life without necessarily finding the thinking that it's important but for those who are conscious about this and are deliberately and intentionally trying to find purpose or or whatever it is they can find purpose you know something bigger than you um i do want to mention that to be fair this group by definition is a group of people who think who think a little significantly outside themselves yeah um, because we are like we are we are we are um intentional about community impact and social impact and we're, we're we're a relatively small group i don't know that we make you know i don't know that we uh, that there, there are a lot of us but i know that the impacts and the work that we put in to make sure that we're driving social change um, so this is the kind of group that think that thinks about purpose a little more or thinks about purpose regularly. Um, I read How Will I Measure Your Life by Professor Clayton Christensen during the period when I was searching or thinking about these things. But I'm curious to know what are the, if it's still okay, these are the practical steps. You're someone in your mid-20s, early 30s, you're thinking about okay, what is next for my life? How am I going to do? You know, I mean, I just like I feel like I have done a couple of things right. I've had a decent career. This are the this work kind of things I'm doing. How do I? find purpose? What are the steps I need to take? What do I need to do to be able to, to just to know that I have clarity of direction or clarity of purpose? Well, the first thing is you must decide concisely what it is that will define your purpose. 
And no one can do it for you. I couldn't do it for you. But once you've decided and you've defined it, you need to repeat it to yourself constantly. Never forget it and never change it. So your purpose can't change according to the wind of the year. It's got to be something which is literally forever. When I was 16, I set my purpose. Now that tells you um, that actually that was a very long time ago because I'm 64 now. So from 16 to 64, I have not changed it. And I've continued with it. So here it is. To speak up for the poor and to bend the power of the prosperous to the potential of the poor. I never, ever, 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 ever think about adjusting that or diminishing it or cutting it in half. Everything fits into that box. To speak up for the poor and bend the power of the prosperous to the potential of the poor. Now, when I was 16, I didn't know what that meant. I just knew that that's what mattered. And as long as I knew that it mattered, I'd then figure out what it meant. Once you figure out what it means, you then start to do it, to get involved. And you don't get distracted by meaningless things that are not helpful. So if you do, for example, to take my bend the power of the prosperous to the potential of the poor. So I worked in, for 13 years, one of the world's biggest corporations, KPMG. It's smaller than EY and PwC and Deloitte, but it's still big. And it's a $30 billion corporation in uh, 160 countries in the world. That's big, that's significant, and it's prominent in Nigeria, as you know. So if I'm in a big, prosperous, prominent corporation, I can push endlessly for profits and bonuses and great gain. And those come. But how do I bend the power of the prosperous to the potential of the poor? Well, in my work with the World Economic Forum, I offered, I offered to create a working group on the future of civil society. And you can look on the World Economic Forum website and you will see the seminal report on the future of civil society, which I was responsible for. Now, civil society used to be defined as things that the UN did or things that charities did or things that government did. And we worked very hard to explain that companies are as vividly vital to civil society as our foundations, as our charities, as, our, as the UN, as our institutions of public interest, as our governments. Companies are as equally vital to that. And creating the fourth leg of the stool of civil society. That was one side. I worked for the World Economic Forum's Refugee Council group so that we could create a strategy, a better strategy on understanding refugee issues and finding solutions to the increasing refugee traffic, which has become exponential, as you know, because of Ukraine and Syria recently. Very important if you're going to bend the power of the prosperous to the potential of the poor. But probably the most vivid example, I got a multi-billion business like KPMG to commit itself to what was the least developed, the least developed. This is according to Professor Jeffrey Sachs from Columbia University in the United States, who was the architect of the Sustainable Development Goals. The least developed village community anywhere on the continent of Africa was Mishawena Village at the top of Pemba Island off the coast of Tanzania just above Zanzibar. And so we spent nine years investing millions of dollars of KPMG profits in developing the life potential of 10,000 people. And there is, uh, if you were to go on the KPMG website, you will find We Build Villages, which is a document of record of what we did. 
Now, how you get a multi-billion business to laser in on one of the toughest communities in the world is because you're doing your purpose. You're doing your purpose. Wherever you are, you define your purpose, you refine your purpose. In other words, you repeat it, you stick to it, and you find the ways to express it. And when you do that, you genuinely, I, I heard your cynical note about find something you really love and you'll never have to work a day in your life. That is, I, be, I do believe in that. It's good to see mm -hmm. Oliver's come back on camera again. Uh, I do believe that because if you really do genuinely believe in things and you get to do them, you don't see it as work. Mm -hmm. You see it as life. And this idea that you're going to work for 30 years and then you're going to retire and put your feet up. I mean, people said to me, oh, why didn't you retire? Why didn't you retire? Why are you always doing these new things? Why, 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 because life has a richness to it, mm. you know, a great richness to it. And the more you can express yourself in giving, there is a, there's never a need not to give. Mm. There's always, always. And it's not, I'm not talking about philanthropy, which is giving money, which is great, and we should. Mm -hmm. um, it's, about, it's about time, absolutely time. Mm. Okay. There's something I I, I I don't think I realize how quickly the time has gone because I did want to ask a question. We've about... been enjoying ourselves <laughs> so much. Um, but a few questions because I've been accused of focusing on a couple of things I'm not uh, of not thinking about entrepreneurs and creators. So I'm going to try and ask some some questions that I think will be a little more value towards these people. So um, relationships are important. Um, very critical. I think it's like one of the most important things. I don't know if it's age or maybe the pandemic has made this much more uh, highlighted how important it is. But to me, I've realized that some of my friendships are the most important to me, literally. Um, I'm curious to know whether there's, there's one person in particular that has had a significant impact on you as a person, as a leader, as who you are today. Uh, maybe somebody you consider a mentor. And outside that one person, what other relationships um, have been most impactful to your life? Well, the wonderful thing of being as old as I am is that you'll have so many people yeah. who matter and so many people who are treasured and so many people, whether they're family or uh, way beyond that. Um, and there are multitudes, they genuinely are. So I, it's very hard for me to pick one, but let me say, let me let me give a let me pick um, let me pick somebody I talk to every Sunday morning without fail at half past seven in the morning. And this is a man. Um, uh, his name is Anton. Um, I won't say his second name. But his name is Anton, and he's serving a life sentence for a murder that he did commit. And he rings me from a prison. Um, in Kent in the UK every Sunday morning at half past seven and one of my sons Kenny uh, joins the call and the three of us speak together for 45 minutes. Now we have been doing this work in that particular uh, particular prison for six years and um, it's relentless. Uh, we're physically there every two months but we're there every week in conversation with different men from the prison, but also in correspondence. I have sitting to the left of me over there, a pile of letters I need to deal with this weekend. Um, mm -hmm. We're in a prison tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, Young Offenders Institute tomorrow. We were in a prison last week, Monday, a different one, which was the lifers, in other words, people who've committed murders prison. Um, now what's happened is fascinating. I went to, and I know you, some of you are gonna go, Ooh, when I tell you this, I went to the main Boko Haram prison in Abuja. Hmm. Oh, yes. Interesting. I've been there. I've been in. First time I've ever been strip searched. <laughs> but I've been in, I've met with, and I took time with over a, about 180 Boko Haram men who are doing life sentences for their crimes. Hmm. They were lovely. Okay. And I realize how difficult this is. Mm. And all the prisoners that we work with, they're wonderful. Mm. Because what you discover about people that the world despises mm. 
is when you get to know them for who they are as compared to the crime or the evil they've committed. You see, the continent of Africa had its greatest opportunity for peacemaking when Nelson Mandela came out of prison after 28 years and alongside Desmond Tutu set up the Peace and Reconciliation Commission. This was also of great use in Rwanda, given the Hutsis and Tutsis and the fight that they had taken on, which led to a genocide. Yeah. You've also recently seen, two weeks ago, that President Kenyatta in Kenya has endorsed his rival, his rival, Raila Odinga, to be the next president of Kenya. And I was present in 2018 in Nairobi to broker their reconciliation between the two of them and to see them embrace and hug and accept each other. And if you want to look it up, you can look up National Prayer Breakfast 2018 Nairobi. You'll see my speech and you can follow all that then happened afterwards. You see, we are so easy to make judgment of other people based on their failures foibles and foolishnesses, very often forgetting our own. Mm. And that's why relationships are so profoundly important. Yeah. I treasure the conversation every week mm. with Anton. I treasure that there's another one who, David rings me. He, the problem with David, he, he, I try to pin him down to an exact time. You know, he rings so randomly. He probably rings five times in the week and I get to speak to him once because he will not ring at one set time. And it's so difficult, but he knows that ultimately we'll always speak every week and all the others. And these are men who's, who've taken life, hmm. who've taken life. And it's so easy then to tut tut on them hmm. and to be ashamed of them, I'm not ashamed of any one of them. Interesting. So if we choose, you see, when people say things like interesting, well, that usually means is I don't agree. <laughs> or it's I, I think I need to, Think about it a little more. I know because it's I, uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it's, it's a hard one because I do get the plus about people not being their sins or not being the effect. However, you hear sometimes of some really gruesome stories, oh. and it's it gets really hard to separate those people from the things that they did. I think I was reading something okay. recently about the woman who killed her two kids because she was trying to, because I think her husband was going to divorce her and she was trying to make sure they didn't, she didn't have access, he didn't have access to them. Um, so, some, some of those things, they are hard for me to like separate the mm -hmm. person and, uh, and act. So yeah, I guess it's just a bit of one, maybe, maybe lack of personal experience with some of these people. Uh, but I know theoretically that these are people and theoretically in my head, it's just maybe the little bit of them. Um, the challenge I would give you then, mm -hmm. and I realize we're nearly up on our time, and I want to yeah. show you two books. Well, the challenge I would therefore give you, not just to you, Simba, but to all, all of you, again, particularly in your circumstance in Nigeria, mm -hmm. is uh, <clears throat> if you really are going to be change makers, mm. you know, you're, you're genuinely going to be, because of your association with the World Economic Forum, and you're going to be global leaders, you're going to be change makers. Then, then find the most difficult people to deal with hmm. and deal with them. Yeah. So, um, Lord Hastings, we're actually supposed to have questions at the end, but we've taken so much time. Man. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to know how much, how much more time you had. So I plan around that. Uh, well, I could do 10 minutes. Okay. 10 minutes, for, so 12, 10. Oh, sorry, yeah. that's... Um, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. All right. So, um, for for everybody who has messaged me about questions, please feel free to send them directly. But there is one here. Um, right. So, a couple of questions. So, someone is asking that: How do we stay in our lights to radiate for those opportunities? So, I think you mentioned earlier about like staying in our lights, or you know, ensuring that you are not hiding your shine. Um, yeah, be willing to be to be noticed. So she's like, how do you stay in your light to ensure that those opportunities are able to find you? Um, mm -hmm. We can live fully. That's the number one question. So a quick answer to that. Um, answer number one is you need to determine what are the principles 
you're going to live by. And so the book I would recommend to all of you, yeah. this, you all know, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Yeah. This, is, this is what I teach as a professor of leadership, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Make okay. sure you know it and you understand it and you prioritize these vital seven habits. That's number one. Uh, number two is if you do what you do. Now, the way those of you who are followers of Jesus would accept Jesus said, don't put your light under a bucket. Don't hide it under a bucket, but you need to make sure that it's seen so that other people can bring glory to God. So don't, you don't do things to be praised by people to give you honors. You do things so that other people see that they may join. When I was a teacher a very long time ago, and I noticed the school that I was teaching in had so much litter and rubbish all over the site, it used to drive me crazy. And I went to go and speak to the head teacher about it. And I said, you know, why don't these caretakers clean the place up? Because it just looks such a mess, these crisp packets and cans and mm -hmm. all the rest, of the rest of it. And he said, oh, the caretakers have given up because the kids just keep throwing it down. And you clean it one day and they come back and throw it down the next. And I just said, this is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. A dirty site encourages bad behavior. So he said, oh, well, we don't know what to do. The caretakers won't clean it up. So I said, well, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. So I took it on to do it. And in my first year as a teacher, I came in every day early, an extra hour early. So I was in the site at seven in the morning and I cleaned it up. Now, after it was probably after about a month, kids noticed the difference. Mm. And then some kids came to me and they said, how come this place is so clean and it's so different and we like it and whatever. I told them, they said, we'll join you. Before I knew where I was, I had an army of children cleaning up. There was so much cleaning up going on, there was no rubbish being put down. <laughs> and, we, and we ended up with, after, after a couple of months, we ended up with such an immaculately clean site, you could have cooked your breakfast on the, on the road. It was that good. And what it did was cha it changed the mood of the atmosphere of work. So radiate, do what you do in such a way that other people can see it in order that they should join you in the fight, not so you should get honor, join you in the fight to do what is right. Hmm. Okay. Um, Lord Hastings, is there a way people can reach out to you after this? Because there's someone that has five questions. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time. So if there's a, an email address or somebody who can contact you, would you be willing for people to reach out to you and connect with you directly? Well, it's, diff it's difficult to answer lots of individual because you can imagine I get bombarded with them. But um, yeah, uh, I don't mind if the person with five questions wants to send the five questions okay. uh, to Olu and then Olu can, can send them to me. All right, about? fantastic. That's fine. Um, there's another really popular question and it is, what do you wish you had known when you were, when you were young? So I said, what do you wish you had known when you were 25? <laughs> That's a good one. Um, I wish when I was younger, I wish I had known that uh, as you get older, you also get seriously creakier. Mm. When you're young, you, you just kind of think you can run everywhere, you can climb every mountain, you can jump over every field, you know, you can, and especially, uh, dare I say it for the young man, you know, the gym, the gym, the gym, the gym, the gym, et cetera. Well, as you get older, that doesn't work. Um, you know, life, age takes its time on you mm. and what's so important um what's so so important is to know how to pace yourself um a, a lot a lot better uh, i think you know if i were to characterize one thing that your generation is bad at doing it is sleeping mm. <laughs> yeah oh yes <laughs> yeah, i can see the smiles i know you're bad at sleeping <laughs> Because, yeah. you know, you've, you've got this thing, you've got this thing, you know, the habits that go on till two o'clock in the morning and all that kind of stuff, which we never had. Mm. Um, so just, and, and not sleeping in the day, like, you know, lazy bums. I mean, not yeah. properly treating the significance of mental and personal and spiritual rest. Mm. It's really important because you can only have a really agile mind i mean warren buffett who's now into his 90s who mm -hmm. continues to be the world's most acutely 
and seismically impactful investor. Mm -hmm. you know, he, he ensures that he has eight hours solid sleep a night and he reads 70% of his day. Mm -hmm. So the critical decisions he makes, he makes from a rested mind. Okay. Was what, you know what tends to happen for your wonderful generation is everything is done in a hurry. Mm -hmm. Which is why, for example, some people who say they're going to be attentive to this call and are actually rushing around with their, with their cameras off and their microphones off, because what they're really trying to do is achieve three things at the same time. Don't. Be present. Okay. Be present. Be present. Okay. There is, a, there is another question here that's similar to one of the questions I had on my original list. I said, could you share one life lesson you would encourage us to live by? The question I had originally was, um, what is the one char characteristic that you believe every leader should possess? So something oh, similar, yeah. Well, I think it's the most characteristic, the most important characteristic of all, and yeah. it's called kindness. 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 Kindness kindness there's a wonderful image um i've got it on my phone somewhere but it's too small to be able to show it up here but there's a wonderful image of um president obama in the united states wandering through the halls of um, capitol hill mm -hmm. uh, the congress building and there is this there is the sweeper man mm -hmm. who is whose job it is literally to keep the place tidy and clean and as the president walks by, he stops and they fist bump together and has a bit of a quick chat with him and then moves on. You know what that will have meant to that man. Mm. Huge, absolutely enormous. Mm. The easy thing to do is to just walk past. Now I can tell you, and I don't say this unkindly deliberately about Nigeria's political leadership, who, by the way, I happen to know personally, but also about African political leadership. Yeah. If you come to Davos, mm -hmm. to the World Economic Forum, and you watch the African leaders, they're mm -hmm. surrounded by military people mm -hmm. and people with caps on and uniforms uh, and all the rest of it. And you watch the European leaders and they're walking around the corridor. Mm -hmm. the, the African ones want to be important. Mm -hmm. So they make out that having people with uniforms and long ceremonies around them makes them important. But the really rich ones don't. Mm. They don't do that. Did you see the pictures yesterday of President Biden sitting down eating pizza mm. with American soldiers in yeah. Poland? Well, show me a Nigerian leader who'd do that. <laughs> they wouldn't because they think they're too important. And you've got to be kind, kind kind real leadership means being kind to other people treating other people with integrity and dignity and esteem that's the most important quality you can have okay thank you Lord Hastings. um there's a question here about um, there are a couple of outstanding global shapers looking to get into development programs at the soas university of london what advice would you have to give to them do a good application <laughs> <laughs> okay and then there's a question about what is your advice for entrepreneurs in nigeria who are focused on building a global business ah so i'm going to refer <laughs> to because okay. i'm going to refer to a cnn if you look it up on the cnn website you will see there was a, a wonderful program maybe five or six years ago a wonderful program about the entrepreneurs of lagos and it's about a 45 minute program. I just loved it. And the wonderful thing about it is there's not a single bad word said about Lagos or its entrepreneurs, not one. It's fascinating, yeah. mm. fascinating. Mm. But what you do see on there mm. is you see endless entrepreneurs doing the same thing, competing with each other in the same space. So they show, for example, a semicircular shopping area in Lagos where virtually every door is a telephone fixing shop or a electronic goods sale shop. They're all, I mean, endless of them, endless, like 25 of them all around this. They're all selling the same thing, all doing the same thing. Mm. 
wouldn't it be more significant if they came together and created a shopping center as compared to competitively different doors? The, the great companies of the United Kingdom, of the United States, uh, the great companies of the West, let me take two organized, two ones, Unilever or Procter & Gamble. They both make the same stuff. You know, your washing stuff, your deodorants, your creams, all these kind of things, your soaps. They, and, they, and they're the big names all over the world. Procter & Gamble and Unilever. Well, just look at their histories. There were lots of small entities that grew up together. Yeah. And many, many companies, I mean, in the, in the UK, we have the company Marks and Spencer. They were two different entities that conjoined to be a meaningful entity of one another. Mira, um, uh, you know, the new uh, Facebook name, not Mira, um, Meta. 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 I'm also Meta, by the way. <laughs> oh, you, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> gotcha. Um, you know, is a conjoin of a number of brands. Fantastic. Great growth brands. Wonderful. What I would say to Nigeria's amazingly powerful entrepreneurial culture is think about who you ought to conjoin with, co-develop with, and co-invest with. Because you can have all these small fighting entities in the circle, or you could make five big, significant, country-developing, internationally, reputationally important organizations and companies. The size of Nigeria, 200 million people, and I'm told by the United Nations, threateningly going to be 400 million people by 2100. Mm. That's a lot of Nigerians that cause havoc. Um, a lot of people. A lot of people. Now you think about the size of Nigeria and you come to London or Paris or Frankfurt or Washington or New York or Singapore, show me a Nigerian company. Mm doesn't exist because everything is individual but you go all the way across from Lagos to Abuja and look for the western companies yeah. so learn the habit of conjoining and collaborating and collaborate and and making common action together can I give you one more book and I have to go then Oh yes, please. There's 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 a, there's a question that is very important. But I think she, that it would be great. To, I, I'm happy to hear the book. But she said, "Can you say a few words about how to rebuild a good reputation? Um, how, to, how to how to rebuild a good reputation or get back from reputation loss from self doubt, analysis paralysis, or not showing up?" I know if time is up, but if you can just give like a quick note in 30 minutes, um, a chill go. I think it okay, how to build a good reputation? That's a really good one. Mm. Um, and it, it's, it's answered by this statement by the American poet Ralph Waldo Emerson, who wrote in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. So this is on the question, how to succeed. You ready? Mm -hmm. Yes. To laugh often and much. Mm -hmm. To win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children. To earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends. To appreciate beauty and find the best in others. Mm -hmm. To leave the world a little better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition. To know that even one life has lived, has breathed easier because you have lived. Mm -hmm. This is to have succeeded. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, Lord Hastings. This has been one of the most authentic conversations that I personally have had. So I really appreciate the openness, the authenticity that you have brought here. And we know that we have gone a little bit over time. We're really grateful for the time. And we look forward to hopefully having you back at some point in the future. And please, if you could just drop the last book that you're going to mention. It'd be great. Yes. So I said you've all seven habits. Yeah. The, the eighth habit. Fantastic. Okay. And the eighth habit by Stephen Covey is from effectiveness to greatness. So if the seven habits are to get you to be seven habits of highly effective, how do you become great from effectiveness? 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lord Hastings. Um, if I didn't get to your questions, I'm so sorry. I apologize. I tried to pick the ones I thought would, um, we just didn't have enough time for it. All right. Do enjoy the rest of your day. And we're definitely sharing this recording for those who want, I'm sure some people want to listen again. We'll be getting this. Thank um, you. Have a fantastic day. Thank you so day. much. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Simbo. Thank you. Thank you, Simbo. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye.